when rumours of a virus turn to evening government updates, when headlines move to daily news of fresh infection growth rates, when schools are closed and holidays postponed, everyone's asking, who's been furloughed? A slight change of plans, just wash your hands, it's like the flu, remember? Let's stay at home, do pee with Joe, it'll be over by September. How long, oh Lord? When streets resemble ghost towns at peak lockdown regulation. When we crave a crowd, cry out for connection from full-blown isolation. When millions search for online church with newfound innovation. Everything's online, but getting loo roll is a hassle. And trust in powers eroded by trips to Barnard Castle. It all ends in tears. There's no quick fix when you're a table of seven, but there's a rule of six. How long, oh Lord? When our dreams are dashed, ambitions strangled, Christmas plans destroyed, and a righteous anger rises at the murder of George Floyd. And when families are asked to grieve behind masks at graves of precious loved ones past, life is in limbo, we're stuck in between. Herd immunity or miracle vaccine, 2020 shortchanged by COVID-19, and children can't get the food that they need. How long, oh Lord? With ever growing numbers of the daily deaths presented, when this is the new normal, when what life was like lamented, and will people stop using the word unprecedented? We are zoomed out, homeschooled out, restrictions extended, and those we love die unattended. How long, oh Lord? I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I'd hoped for from the Lord and my soul is downcast within me. And yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's a really powerful video, isn't it? That's a guy called Phil Knox, who's a contemporary uh, Christian poet, and he's written a COVID lament um, and just pouring out his pain before God. Um, and I think uh, many of us probably could relate to a number of the phrases that he put in that because it has been quite a bruising year. I feel like every time uh, up here on a Sunday that I say that. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again today. We're continuing today our whole series for the summer, which is based around Psalm 23 and particularly the verse within it that says, He restores my soul. And I was really struck, I thought it was really powerful when Emma was praying for physical healing this morning. And uh, re you really could feel the power of the Holy Spirit here. I'm sure you could feel the power of the Holy Spirit where you are as well. And we need physical healing. I believe that Jesus has the power to bring physical healing. But you know what? In this season, many of us need soul healing. We need restoration in our hearts and in our spirits. And Jesus, in the same way as he's able to bring physical healing, he's also able to bring soul restoration and soul healing. And today, um, over this whole series, we're kind of looking at different uh, elements of things that bring soul restoration, or as Jody called it at the start of this series, uh, bringing our souls back. And so we've been looking at some of the practices like Sabbath, like silence and solitude, and uh, like the power of the word of God. Today, we're going to look at the practice of lament. In other words, grieving well. In uh, Proverbs chapter 4, there's a famous verse that we quite often uh, quote, but it says this, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Such a powerful verse, such a deep verse. But what that verse says is it says that the, if our heart goes well, the whole of our life goes well. And that also means that if our heart is sick, then the rest of our life will be sick as well. And I think the reality is over this last 18 months or so, many of us have lost many things in different ways in one way or another. Some of us, we've lost 
holiday plans. Some of us, we've lost hopes and dreams, planned celebrations, maybe significant birthdays, and the celebration has been a, had to be postponed. Some of us have lost financially. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have experienced pressure on relationships like never before. Some of us have lost the ability to regularly meet with loved ones. Some of us have lost friendships. There's been a lot of division, I think, in the nation um, as we've been squeezed. And I think for many of us, there's a, loss, there's a lot of pain that is associated with that loss. And one of the things that I believe that God wants us to do is find soul restoration by bringing him into that pain so he can bring some healing. And today we're looking at the book of uh, Psalms and we're looking at the pattern of the book of Psalms. I'm going to ask you a question. If you're brave, you can try and answer it on the chat stream. And in a, in a couple of minutes, I'll give you the answer to it. But there's 150 Psalms written in the book of Psalms. How many of them do you think are associated with lamenting? So out of the 150 Psalms, how many of them do you think are Psalms of lament? Lament means, means to grieve something that you've lost. So out of the 150 Psalms, how many of them do you think are Psalms of lament? Now, if we look at the different types of Psalm that they are, and we categorize them, that will help us get to the answer. Um, but one category of Psalms are Psalms of praise and worship. Psalm 8 is, O Lord, O our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Emma started with a psalm of praise and worship as well at the beginning of the service. Um, psalm 100 is, is a psalm of thanksgiving, which is another category of uh, psalms. You'll know Psalm 100 because it talks about entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The psalms that are based around wisdom. So Psalm 1 talks about um, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And it goes on to talk about his delight is in the word, the um word of the Lord. So they're psalms that bring wisdom to us. There's a whole category of psalms from 93 through to 99, which are rural psalms, and they're all about God being the one and only true king, and they were used at public festivals to, as a part of their worship to enthrone God. And then the psalms of lament. So if you had a guess at how many of the 150 psalms are psalms of lament, well, let me tell you, it's probably more than you were expecting. So if you count them up, there's no less than 58 psalms of lament. That's over a third of the total number of psalms. 42 of them are psalms of personal lament. So they're people wrestling with personal loss and personal grief. And another 16 are corporate ones, whereas Israel as a nation are wrestling with a sense of loss and a sense of grief. But what happens in Psalms is, is there's a pattern to processing that grief. And you see, we know physically that um, if we eat the wrong things, then our arteries fur up and that creates heart disease, which puts us at a risk of a heart attack. Now, if when we face grief and hardship and loss, if we don't recognize that and bring it to Jesus for healing, the same thing happens. It's like our spiritual life, our spiritual arteries, they fur up and our heart starts to get sick. Our faith seems to disappear. We start to feel heavy about it in life and uh, we carry a deep sense of disappointment and it eats away at everything else. Now, if in this season we're going to find soul restoration, part of what we need to do is give ourselves time to grieve. Give ourselves time to feel the loss, to, to recognize the loss, but to deal with the loss. So Jesus, who is the good shepherd who restores our soul, can renew our hearts and free us so our hearts are healthy to face the next season. And in the Psalms of Lament, there's a common pattern to them, and it's a, it's a pattern that has four steps to it. In general, the Psalms of Lament, they begin with an address to God, so there's a recognition that it's God that we need to come to. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Then there's a complaint. There's an airing of the, of the grief or the loss or the frustration or the agony. Then there's a request for help. And then it ends with an affirmation of trusting God. And so I just want to take those four steps, because if that's the steps and the framework that is given us in the book of Psalms, 
I would think that that is probably God's framework for helping us deal with grief and loss in life. So I'm going to take those four steps and unpack them a little bit for us. And my prayer through this morning is that actually God will use these steps to help us get in touch with some of our grief and loss of this last season. But more importantly than that, or on from that, actually bring it to Jesus, bring it to the one who is able to restore and heal our souls. So step one is we need to bring it to God. We need to look to Jesus. In John chapter six, um, when uh, Jesus is quite challenging to uh, the crowd that are following after him, and uh, a lot of them get upset with him, and so they leave him and they wander away. And he turns to Simon Peter and he says, are you gonna leave as well? And Simon responds and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I just wanna to say to you this morning, Jesus is able and willing to heal every hurting heart. Jesus is willing and able to heal every hurt, hurting heart because he has the words of eternal life. And I think um, quite often when we get disappointed, what happens is we blame God and we get angry with God. And sometimes that stops us from realizing that he's the one that we need to come to for healing. Do you know, we're talking about the number of psalms that are psalms of lament. Actually, there's 150 psalms. Who wrote the most of them? You probably know the answer to that. Put it on the chat stream, but you have to be quick. Who wrote the most of psalms? David. David wrote 73 of the 150. Do you know how David is described in the New Testament? He's described as a, a man after God's own heart. And David understood heart language. And uh, David went through uh, glorious times of victory like, against Goliath and that kind of thing. He also went through incredibly tough and painful times when he was on the run from Saul and he feared for his life. And all the different emotions and the agonies, they get poured out in the book of Psalms. In uh, Psalm 13, he cries out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And I think sometimes, and, and maybe it's a British thing, I, I don't know, maybe it's wider than that. I can only speak as a British guy. But sometimes I think many of us have grown up with the sense that it's impolite or rude to bring our pain and frustration to God. Because we know he's a holy God. It's, it's like almost like, I think maybe some of us have been taught in the past, or it's been said to us, it's kind of shameful to question God or bring our stuff out. Actually, if you read through the book of Psalms, that's not true at all. And David is commended for being a man after God's own heart. And David is comfortable to bring his frustrations, his questions, his agonies, his pain into the presence of God. And it seems to me that J David continued to live out being a man after his own heart because he brought that stuff to God. And you see, the reality is God created our emotions and God is not afraid of our emotions. And Jesus, when he walked on the earth, he expressed anger when he turned over the tables in the temple. That would have been quite scary. That was quite extreme anger. When uh, Mary and Martha were brokenhearted over the loss of their brother, he sat down and he wept. And he wept over Jerusalem. When he heard of the murder of his cousin, John the Baptist, it says Jesus withdrew to a lonely place by himself because he needed to go away and grieve. And Jesus, uh, our role model of uh, the perfect man, God in a man, he was comfortable with emotion and God is comfortable with our emotion and he wants us to help, he wants to help us to process and uh, deal with our emotions, good or bad. And so the first thing we need to know is we can come to God and as a loving father, he's a safe place to come and unpack your pain and your sorrow, your heartbreak, your questions. He is a safe person to come to, maybe the safest person to come to. And I just wanna give you permission this morning to let your emotions go and to bring them into the presence of God. So number one, we need to look to Jesus. Number two, we need to share our pain. We need to be willing or make a choice, be brave enough, be vulnerable enough to share our pain. 
Isaiah chapter 54, famous bit of the, the Bible. Surely it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. And Jesus, when he was crucified, went through such incredible pain. Some of it was physical pain. Some of it was, was emotional pain as he was rejected by the crowd, as he was deserted by his disciples, as he experienced separation from, his, uh, uh, from God as he was hanging on the cross because he was taking our sins. And Jesus knows what it is to experience pain and he wants to carry it away from us. Now, the first thing though that we have to do is take time to identify our pain. Now, for some of us, that's easier than others. Love the fact that this is a sweeping generalization, but it's a biblical generalization, so hopefully you can forgive me for that. But when God made woman, he took something that was inside the man, the rib, and brought it outside. And I believe in that creation picture, part of what God did when he created woman from man was take some of the inner life and bring it out and into the outer world. And I think on the whole, women are more comfortable with the language of emotion because they were born out of the heart of a man. I think for some of us men, our emotion is buried a lot deeper and we really struggle to express our emotion. And for us, sometimes it's harder. And the thing is, you cannot process what you do not recognize. And so if this last season has been a real challenge, can I encourage you, as we get a bit of space, hopefully, over this summer season, as we get a holiday, let's make it into a holy day. And let's take some time to process some of this stuff. And can I give you some tips, some simple tips that I found helpful uh, for me to identify and understand some of the sorrows and loss, because sometimes it just builds up bit by bit, and then we don't really recognize that it's built up, and so we don't deal with it. And so as you get a bit of time and space, or create in your diary a bit of time and space, use that space to identify some of the losses that you've experienced over the last year or so. Actually, it may be a helpful thing to do. Tip number one, why not sit down with a piece of paper and write a list? of every grief or every loss that you've experienced over the last 18 months. As we move on to the next step, I'll tell you what to do with it. But to begin with, let's just start compiling the list. Second tip, if, uh, if you find it helpful, find someone to talk to. When I was really struggling at the end of last year and I knew I was in trouble, emotionally, personally, um, the way I solved it, was by finding someone to talk to, by finding a counsellor. I also leaned severely into friends in that season. Um, but talking to someone, and, and I don't meet uh, my counsellor very often, well, once a month, I don't know whether that's often or not really. Um, but we just talk for an hour and it helps me process what's going on in my life. And so you can, Pay for a counsellor. For me, a lot of the relationships I'm involved in, they're, they're um, not places where I can just receive. And so for me, it works to pay a counsellor to listen to me. Um, <laughs> and, and that helps me process stuff. Sometimes we can do that with friends. If you have a spouse, your spouse can probably tell you some of the griefs that you're carry carrying. And sometimes they can see it more clearly than we can. So sometimes it's helpful to... Um, talk to someone, spend some time in conversation. I often find when I'm talking about things, I'll hit some emotion suddenly, and I'll realize, oh, that's the thing that's really hurting. That's the thing that's at the bottom of it. You need to take note of it, because that's my grief coming up to the um, surface. Another thing that you can do is take some space. Where we've been talking about silence and solitude, take some time, go on a walk, spend some time with God and reflect. I was also reading a really good, helpful blog recently of a, of a woman who said that for her, it's writing that puts her in touch with her feelings. And, and she says that out of um, working with other people, she's found if you take four consecutive days and just take 20 minutes on each of the four days and just write on a pad what you're thinking, what you're feeling, First thing is coming out to you. She reckons if you do four consecutive days of just writing for 20 minutes, 
by the end of those four days, you will have identified exactly what you've been feeling, exactly what's going on in your life. And that's just a simple practice about making time. Um, my other uh, tip, or the thing that I do, is I listen to myself. So I listen to my words. Jesus says um, that one of the ways you can tell your heart house, health is by the words, because they're the overflow of your heart. Do I speak negatively about someone? Am I, do I speak angry words about them? Um, am I cynical or unbelieving? Actually, if you just listen to your words, it's one of the ways you can tell what's going on in your heart. So listening to your words and what you say, listen to your feelings as well. When that person posts on social media, does it wind you up? When something small happens, do you have a massive reaction to it? That's normally a sign that there's something else going on that's unprocessed. So take the time to think, that was only a small thing. Why was my reaction so big? What of my history or what of the recent events is still going on? Why is my reaction so over the top? But you see, if we give ourselves a bit of time and we do some of these practices, it helps us be in touch with our pain. Because it's only if we recognize it and we get in touch with it, can we then name it and start to deal with it. So step one, we need to come to Jesus because he's the healer, the restorer of our souls. Step two, we need to go through the discomfort of feeling our pain. Over lockdown, rates of addiction have escalated because people have been in pain and they've sought ways to anesthetize it. Every person I've ever known that's struggled with an addiction, they've had some pain somewhere that they're trying to anesthetize or cover up or numb themselves from with the addiction, which also tells you the pathway to freedom. The pathway to freedom is stop anesthetizing it. I know it will be painful. I know it will hurt. I know you will cry. But tears are God's release valve for pain that we're carrying on our hearts. And if we don't release it, it has the power to destroy us or blow up in unhelpful ways. And so again, make some time, find a safe place, but be willing to feel your pain because then you can come to a place where you can find healing. Step three, ask God for healing. Ask God for healing. Psalm, um, Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. And there's an exchange process that Jesus invites us to when we come to the cross. When we first come to the cross, he invites us to let go of our sin, to repent of it, and to give it to him, to see him carrying it on the cross. And as we give our sin to him and let go of it, so he exchanges it for his forgiveness and his cleansing, and we become new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. Well, exactly the same principle we need to apply with our pain and with our griefs and with our losses we need to bring them to Jesus. We need to give them to him so that he can replace them. And as Isaiah 61 says, he can take um, a, a, a mourning and turn it into dancing. He can, he can take the spirit of despair and, uh, and turn it into hope again. And there's a divine trade that we do when we come to the cross. And one of the things when you recognize your pain or when you're living in pain Find a way that for you helps you to bring it to the cross and to exchange it for Jesus's healing. And for me, I'm someone, if I can take a physical action or do something physical, sometimes for me that helps embody the um, principle that I'm looking to do. So sometimes it's enough for me just to say, oh, I'm really angry at Richard because the shot he got on a Sunday morning of me wasn't as good as it could have been. Well, I can deal with that quite simply. You know, he made the zit on my cheek look, uh, be in full focus or something like that. Um, but I can deal with that quite easily, quite often, just by saying, God, I choose to forgive Richard. And I let go of the hurt. I let go of the offense. And I receive your forgiveness. And I pray blessing on him. And sometimes it's as simple as that prayer. Sometimes, though, the issues that we're dealing with are bigger than that. And so the action that we need to take is a bit more substantial than that. Just think about a couple of, of stories for you. One is, um, 
when I f became a Christian, became a Christian at university through an amazing guy who um, was a, a huge and formative role model in my life. Um, a few years later, he went through a really difficult time and kind of crashed and burnt in his faith. And where he'd been a significant role model to me, um, he became a huge source of pain. And he took out a lot of his anger and his frustration on me, and it cut me really deeply. It's like, like my best friend turned against me. Um, and there were a number of incidences where he hurt me over and over again. And uh, one night I, meant to, uh, I went to meet with a group of friends up in the center of town uh, with him. And um, he was really nasty as part of the evening. And it cut really deep. And uh, I got home. And in some ways, it kind of felt like the final straw. And I went to bed, and I couldn't sleep at all well. Um, and so I was awake most of the night. And I got up in the morning, and I thought, I've got to deal with this. I've got to get the other side of it, because it was like it was consuming me. And that's what unresolved stuff does, isn't it? And particularly anger and unforgiveness and hurt. It just consumes us, and it robs all life from us. And so I was thinking, I've got to find a way to deal with this. And I started to pray about it. And, and um, I just felt God say, write down all the things you're hurt about. And so I wrote down on a pad of paper, I wrote down everything I could think of, every instance I could think of where it hurt me in spoken hard words or, or done hurtful things. And, uh, and then I, I just felt a prompt. I went and I got a baking tray and I ripped out the, the page of paper and I ripped it up and each offence, I screwed it up and I put it in the baking tray. And as I screwed it up and I put it in the baking tray, I said, Lord Jesus, I give this to you and I give the hurt to you and I choose to forgive him. And I did it and, and I, had a, I had a big list, a big list. And so, I had, so my baking tray was very full of paper really quickly. But doing something physical and practical really helped me give it over to Jesus. And then when I had uh, done it all and I had a full baking tray, I went and got some matches and I set fire to it and it all burnt up. And then when it cooled down, threw it all away. And as I threw it away, I said to God, it's gone. It is finished. It's over in Jesus' name. And you know what? From that very moment, my heart attitude towards the guy totally changed. And all the weight I was carrying totally disappeared. And I found freedom and I was able to uh, reconnect with him. I was able to bless him. I was able to uh, pick up some semblance of friendship simply because I'd resolved the heart issue. And I think sometimes if we can find a way of inviting Jesus into it and a physical way that kind of demonstrates, enables us to focus the steps that we're doing, it enables us to step into freedom. Another story, really lovely story. I used to... Um, every year work at Spring Harvest. It's a, uh, people who don't know what that is, it's kind of a big Christian camp that happens at Butlins every Easter. Um, yeah, it's more exciting than that. Um, and uh, I used to go back in the day when Butlins wasn't quite as nice as it is these days. But anyway, um, I used to go there and I used to work with people who aren't Christians because they used to, there's always people, family members and things who end up at this Christian camp and they don't know Jesus yet. And so I used to run events for them, get to know them, become a friend with them and stuff. But in, in any spare time I had, I uh, had to join the counselling team and be part of the counselling team. And there's some people and they struggle to find people who understand these kind of things in their church. And so it's like they save up all of their stuff from the year and they take it to spring harvest and pour it out with a counsellor. So um, I used to uh, spend some time with some of those people. We had a woman who uh, was quite a new Christian who came to see us at one appointment. And it was really heartbreaking because she was quite a new Christian and she had a small toddler and uh, the toddler was knocked down and died. And she came to see us because she was broken hearted over the loss of her toddler. And it was like the grief she was carrying had separated her from God. And she'd come to this Christian conference and it was like, I can't worship. I can't make sense of whatever anybody's saying because all I'm feeling is rage and hurt and upset and I don't know how to resolve it. And so we sat and talked to her and talked to her about the fact it was a grief and that, uh, that Jesus wanted to heal her of her grief. And we talked her through the fact that it wasn't God that took her toddler. I, everything that happens in life is not God's fault. Jesus actually says in John chapter 10, he says, the enemy, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the enemy wants to rob from us. The enemy wants to weigh us down with sorrow. The enemy wants to ruin God's plans for our life. 
And actually, a lot of us, we misdirect the anger at God when we should put our anger on the enemy and go to Jesus for our healing. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. That's a restoration of soul. That's God's healing. And so we talked her through that and we said, you need to give your grief to God. And, uh, and she said, I'm not ready to do that yet. And we said, no, that's fine. And she came to us every day for about three days. And she said, each day, she said, tomorrow I might have the strength to do it. Tomorrow I might have the courage to do it. Tomorrow I might have the courage to do it. And on the last day, I thought she's going to do it now. And we got to the point of praying with her. And she sat with us and she said, I can't give my grief to Jesus because my grief is all I've got left of my baby. And it was heartbreaking that we had to let her go at the end of that. What was beautiful, though, about six weeks later, I got a letter through the post. And this woman said, I went home and I thought about all the things you said, and I knew that I had to give my grief to Jesus. And so I contacted a friend of mine. And I said, will you pray with me? I want to give this grief over to Jesus. And she said, when I went to pray, I suddenly had a picture of Jesus on the cross. And it's like God spoke to me and he said, if you give your grief to me, what you're doing is you're putting it at the foot of the cross. And any time you come into my presence in worship, any time you take communion, any time you reflect on the cross, you're coming to the place where your baby is. And she said, and I realized I didn't have to carry my grief anywhere anymore. There was a safe place I could bring it. Maybe for some of us today, this last season has brought many griefs into our life. If we lay it at the feet of Jesus, we're able to be freed from the burden of that and exchange it for healing and restoration. Maybe that picture is for someone, maybe there's someone watching this morning and you've had a miscarriage or you've lost a child and you've never been able to get past the grief of it. Maybe this morning Jesus is saying, this is your moment, bring it to me. So step number one, look to Jesus. Step number two, share your pain. Step number three, ask for healing. And then step number four, what seals the deal? Go back to worshipping God. Go back to declaring his goodness. It's, uh, some people use this as a controversial bit of theology. We won't go into the depths of it. In Job chapter one, when Job doesn't understand what is happening to him, he worships and he says, the Lord gave, the Lord's taken away. I'm going to bless the name of the Lord. And you know, there's some situations in life we don't have the answers to. There's some things we don't understand why our prayers haven't come through yet. There's some things we don't understand why we've had to go through them. But faith says, I'm going to bless God anyway. Faith says, I'm going to worship him anyway. Faith says, I'm going to trust that he can bring me through this. And one day I might understand. And in the interim, he can wipe away my tears. He can bring healing to me and he can bring restoration. And it's true. And a common pattern in all of these Psalms of Lament is through all the wrestling and everything else, every time they come through to a place of healing and restoration that ends up in a declaration of, but God is good. But God is good. But I can trust in him. But he will carry me through. And they end up in a place of surrounding themselves with the goodness of God. And you know those words are true. God is good. God is able to carry you through. God is able to wipe away your tears. God is able to bring healing and restoration. But it's a process that we need to go through. And it's a process that we need to cooperate with God over. And this morning, surely, surely, it's not a good idea to keep hold of those heart hurts. Surely, surely, it's not a good idea to keep hold of that unforgiveness. Surely, surely, it's not good, a good idea to keep hold of that anger. Surely, surely, the health of your soul means that Jesus is inviting you to give it to him and exchange it for his healing. We're going to pray in a moment. I'll invite the worship team back. I know I've opened up a big issue. 
And maybe this morning has brought to the surface some really deep stuff for you. We have a prayer team on hand. If you click the request prayer option, you'll be put in touch with someone that will either pray with you today or can help you be put in touch with someone who can contact you, can come around to see you or make an appointment to see you and pray with you. In this season, I believe Jesus wants to show himself to be the restorer of our souls. Let's pray. Lord, I know that this season has been a brutal one in many ways for many of us. Lord, I know many of us are carrying griefs and sorrows. Such a sense of loss in so many ways. And Lord, just like the nation of Israel came to waters that were bitter, and you spoke to Moses and told him to put a branch of a tree into the middle of the bitter water, and you made it sweet. Father, into the pool of our griefs and our sorrows. Lord, we invite you to plant the power of the cross. And just like that lady, with the pain of the loss of her baby, Lord, we bring our griefs and our sorrows to you. Lord, we fall at the feet of the cross, at the foot of the cross afresh. And we bring our tears, we bring our sadness, we bring our heartbreak. We bring it to the one who knows, the one who understands, the one who is Emmanuel, God with us. And the one who is able to stand alongside us, who when we weep, he weeps. Lord, may each one of us right now know your presence, know your love invading our hearts, filling and flooding us, and bringing healing and restoration. Band are going to pick it up in worship, but just where you are, invite the Holy Spirit to be at work in your heart and to be exchanging the grief for healing. If the tears are starting to flow, then let them come. Don't let your grief be bottled up. Let it flow. Let God wash it out and replace it with his healing and his restoration. Let's worship.